Now, in this uh, uh, ASEAN committee, ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission, there are 10 ASEAN nations involved. One school of thought within the commission is you cannot take away fundamental rights under any circumstances. We shall call this the first school of thought for purposes of our discussion reference. The other school of thought is that the exercise of human rights, even fundamental freedoms, must be subordinated to certain prescribed state sanction principle of public interest or the public good. We shall call this the second school of thought accordingly. Now, underlying this debate, underlying this school of thoughts, um, is the organizing principle of our society, which is the primacy of the state, assuming, of course, proper exercise of its powers. Would the first school of thought then dismantle this vital organizing principle of our society? What weight then do we give to state sanction acts? In this case, qua human rights. That is at the macro level. At the practical level, if one needs to influence the first school of thought, would the ethical value of human flourishing which underlie every single fundamental freedom be proscribed. And when you think of state sanction acts, we need to remember Hitler, for example. Hitler's programs were state sanctioned, but we would say they were morally bad. Was he effective? Initially, yes. But when he led his followers to disaster, that rendered him also ineffective. Nearer time, so also was Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein led effectively uh, in the initial years Iraq to nationhood, but we would say that he was brutal and brought harm to his people. I was in Yugoslavia recently, a couple of months back, and heard from the officials of the stories of Slobodan Milosovic, who became the third president of the Czech Republic to lead Yugoslavia. But he found himself tried at the Hague for war crimes, for butchering the Serbs. He died, of course, in the course of this trial. How would you classify Hitler, Saddam Hussein, and Milosovic within the subject matter that we were discussing? But where would you put Bill Clinton? This would then lead me to the next matter. And that is, how do we judge effectiveness and ethics in leadership? And here I'm guided by Joseph Nye, the former dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government, uh, in his book, Powers to Lead, and he says this, and I quote, in practice, we can judge both effectiveness and ethics in three dimensions, goals, means, and consequences. Effective goals combine realism and risk in a vision that can be implemented, whereas ethical goals are judged by the morality of the intentions and vision. Good goals have to meet our moral standards as well as a feasibility test. Now, on means, he says, effective means are those that are efficient for achieving the goals, but ethical means depend on the quality, not the efficiency, of the approaches employed. And thirdly, a leader's consequential effectiveness involves achieving the group's goals, but ethical consequences means good results, not just for the in-group, but for outsiders as well. So let me try and relate uh, Joseph Nye's uh, uh, analysis to the clearance of the backlog of cases, of a few thousand cases, at the courts when I took office as the senior district judge in 1991. You have no doubt heard of the aphorism, justice delayed is justice denied. The goal in the clearance was uh, to clear the backlog of cases which have been in the courts, dockets, 
for many years, for several years. Remedies sought must be considered without undue haste. Liberties of accused persons must be decided promptly. The ethical goals are certainly commendable if, if effective goals recognize the transactional realities of the processes, the various stakeholders involved, the litigating parties, and the public agencies. Now, the means to do this were to reallocate scarce uh, resources. For example, we've got night courts and interject uh, or, or, or put uh, in the process hateway processes such as mediation, ensuring that these means are not hurried or speedy or basement justice through established public protocols and amendments to rules of court. It was essential that justice was done and seen to be done, which is the ethics part of it. In a short period, the backlog of cases was cleared. Litigating parties had the day in court. Justice was administered in our society. Independent public surveys showed 95% confidence in our justice processes and systems. The World Bank acknowledged our justice reforms as exemplary for developed and developing jurisdictions. And that was a happy example, but not the next one. Leaders to be effective can be caught between the rock and the hard place, a dilemma. I talk about public and private morality. Let me discuss a conundrum on the ethical part of the equation. I am not personally in favor of gambling, yet fan myself as chairman of the Casino Regulatory Authority. Can a leader maintain his conscience and sense of integrity by distinguishing between the public square and his own private space? Joseph Nye pointed out that the 52nd governor of New York, Mario Matthew Cuomo, was personally opposed to abortion as a Catholic. But he argued that in his role as governor, he was obligated to think of the requirements of a public official in a pluralistic democracy. He kept the public and the private spheres separate. But can you really? Michael Sandel, professor of philosophy at Harvard, in his recent book, What Money Can't Buy, tells the story. It's a very interesting story. Barbara Harris is the founder of a North Carolina-based charity called Project Prevention, launched in 1997. Each year, hundreds of thousands of babies are born to drug-addicted mothers. Some of these babies are addicted to drugs, and a great many of them will suffer child abuse or neglect. Barbara Harris offers a market-based solution. Offer drug-addicted women $300, the US $300 cash, if they will undergo sterilization or long-term birth control. More than 3,000 women had taken up uh, this particular offer. Of course, critics call this morally reprehensible a bribe for sterilization. The argument is that offering drug addicts a financial inducement to give up their reproductive capacity amounts to coercion, especially since the program targets vulnerable women in very poor neighborhoods. But Barbara moralizes that a woman's right to procreate is not more important than the right of a child to have a moral life. Now, there seems to be two equally compelling standards in the public square. And Barbara has decided to dirty her hands. A dirty hand is a well-known uh, process in leadership. It is when leaders in the interest of the group for whom they serve may have to do things they would be unwilling to do in their private lives.